And so your mind is just absorbing whatever is playing. It's the TV mind, which is receiving stuff from where it comes from, is going into your mind. And you become a no longer thinking your own thoughts. Occasionally your mind is saying, oh, this guy is so stupid, and then you're watching again. <laughs> What do you think about Facebook? <laughs> Is it a healthy format? It seems a bit egoic. Not a whole lot of transmission of connection, love, etc. Posting pictures of yourself and quantifying friends, likes, etc. seems like enhancing the ego. Are we going down the wrong path with social media? Well, The questioner has a point, as even before the advent of Facebook and similar things for hundreds of years or thousands of years, people constructed for themselves an identity in their head. That's me, me and my story as I sometimes call it. And that was partly uh, inherited from the, what your culture tells you you are, or your family and your culture, and partly by choice, certain things you choose to identify with and then incorporate into your sense of self, certain possessions, certain achievements, or the lack of certain possessions and achievements can all be incorporated, they, come, they become mind forms or thought forms, which become which you identify with, so you've, there's a mental image that forms, and that's the essence of ego, a mental image that's me. So that's been going on for a long time, and then people live through that mental image of me. They seek out things or people that can improve the mental image of me and try to keep away things or people that could weaken or threaten the mental image of me. It all means not being in touch with who you are beyond any mental image, which is why we are here, to go deep into that. And now we got the technology of Facebook where you can externalize the image and you can create on the Facebook page, you can create the image of me and show it to the whole world. <laughs> and so, Many young people, and maybe even not so young, I believe the oldest Facebook user, I saw a video clip in the States, the world's oldest Facebook user is 105 years old. And it, can, it is often used unconsciously in enhancing the image one has of oneself and the image one wants to show to the world. And then you read other people's images on their Facebook page and you think that's who they are. And then you try to compete with that image and you try to polish up your image and compete with them. <coughs> most people want to show off, it seems. I'm not that familiar with it, but most people want to show the good things. I'm having this great meal, here's a picture of it. Why would anybody <laughs> want to see what you're eating right now? But they do, it seems. Or, Oh, I just bought this thing, do you want to see it? And then you can connect people to a place where you bought it, it's another thing, and all kinds of things that I don't understand. So you can, it's a, in many cases, it becomes an artificial construct that you add to every day, and everybody else has their artificial con construct, and it can actually strengthen the delusion of, of, that, of the false self. It doesn't have to, but often it does. Facebook can also be used in conveying interesting information and to connect with people at a deeper level or bringing about spirits, some spiritual knowledge. Uh, so that's not impossible. I used to post occasionally things. I don't do it myself, but I would send it to Steve and he would post it. But I, haven't, I must admit I haven't done it in a while. Although some things do get posted, 
quotes and so on, that's fine. Twitter is another one that is a uh, <laughs> there's a there's a Twitter message coming in. <laughs> The last time I tweeted was uh, when a few months ago, in February, uh, the Oprah Channel in the States, I don't know if you can g get it here, it's called the OWN Channel, Oprah Winfrey Network. Uh, they showed a repeat of our webinar that we did a few years ago that I did with Oprah. They did a slightly shortened edited version over a period of Ten weeks, ten Sundays, the uh, New Earth was shown again. On this time, not on the internet, but well, also on the internet, but on TV. On and Oprah sometimes is an active tweeter, and she said it would be great if we could tweet at the same time while this program is being shown. And so I said, okay, I'll see what I can do. So I was on the phone with Steve while it, the program was running and then I was watching it and then people sent in these questions and they have to be answered immediately. <laughs> <coughs> so I was attempting to dictate answers to Steve and, uh, and his assistant who put, the, uh, put in the answers. Uh, and my mind was quite... Uh, or I felt almost dizzy afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> because I tried to watch the program and at the same time watch the incoming tweets and think of an answer. <coughs> but Oprah must have realized it wasn't from me because she said uh, Twitter is the exact opposite of how you operate. <laughs> And before Oprah said it, Kim said exactly the same thing to me. <laughs> <coughs> and that's true. So I was glad when it was over. But while it was happening, I was surrendered to it, although I did feel, feel dizzy afterwards. <laughs> so if, if you can avoid constructing some pseudo-identity for yourself on Facebook and be more real, then you can avoid that trap of just the Facebook amplifying the human ego, which is, it does in many, many cases, especially for youngsters who have no idea what they're doing. Oh, yes. Can you speak about how to be in this world with this constant push for connectivity? On the, how, did we, how did we get to the most profound things <coughs> from a relatively simple question? Oh yes, we talked about doing and being without feeling that being present is another thing to do. How to be in this world without this constant push for connectivity? Well, the first thing is you turn off your push notifications. <laughs> <laughs> It's already a big step forward. <laughs> <clears throat> and you need to be disciplined in the use of your device, your phone, whatever, tablet, phone, so that it doesn't take you over because it's simply an extension of the mind. And if it wasn't enough before we invented these devices, humans had already been taken over by their minds. Even 2,000 years ago, not, not as much as now, but even 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, why are you always thinking about tomorrow? Why are you always worried about the next thing? Look at the flower, look how it lives. In total alignment with the present moment. And it's being sustained. by the one consciousness. That's my translation of a... <laughs> so already then, humans had been taken over by 
by mind, but even more so since then, it's her mind has proliferated, and then the clever human mind came up with these devices. Said, let's extend ourselves into the realm of things, and then we can create this, which is an extension of the human mind. So, when you you might have noticed when you are uh, when you are with yourself you have the voice in the head unless you begin to awaken in which case you are able to experience spaces of st alert still presence it's beautiful but otherwise you have this thing commenting talking arguing oh, no, yeah. And then this becomes a burden for many people. Of course it is a burden, because a lot of the stuff it says is actually not pleasant. And so you experience it as a burden, and since you derive your sense of identity from it, it becomes yourself. You, this talking voice, you think that's you. It becomes the self. And you walk around with this, this burden of the self. And in order to unburden yourself, one thing you can do, we would think you can do, is you can watch the television, or you can go on, to watch. there are countless things that you can watch on the little screen. The entire world's knowledge at your fingertips. And the moment you watch the screen, whether it's television or whatever the screen, you might have noticed that the your own, your so-called own thought processes come to a stop, so to some extent you're free of the self. This is why people sometimes find watching television relaxing, say, okay, I just need to relax now, let's turn it on. By this they mean, while they watch the television screen, they are not burdened by their self-induced thought processes. What they do, however, they replace the, their own thoughts with the th collective thoughts. So they just, they, you're in a state, you're not in a state of thoughtless awareness when you watch television or you watch something on the screen. You absorb the thoughts from there into your mind and you, you link in. So it, it, for people often are in a state of semi or hypnosis when they watch and it kind of paralyzes you. It can also happen with the screen, with television already started, of course, um, I don't know when, whenever, tell, 60 years ago, whenever television started, and you go, hmm. and so your mind is just absorbing whatever is playing. It, it's the TV mind, which is receiving stuff from wherever it comes from, is going into your mind, and you become a I'm no longer thinking your own thoughts. Occasionally you might, you say, oh, this guy is so stupid, and then you're watching again. <laughs> and then another thought, why am I watching this rubbish? <laughs> Half an hour later, this is so awful. <laughs> but you can't, you can't, can't turn it off. Here's the, here's the remote. Let's, let's just try one more channel, there might be something else there. Oh, oh no, that's stupid. <laughs> try one more. This is, the, this is how an addict behaves. And the device is even more addictive, you, because you have, carry them with you. And uh, you have to admit, you may have to admit, that you, there is an addiction in you, not everybody here, but quite a few, it would be almost normal to feel this draw towards it, and you use it even when you don't need to use it. That's the amazing thing. When you're standing at the elevator, waiting, so another person is standing next to you, and he or she is pulling out the phone, and then you pull out yours. You don't know why. <laughs> Or anywhere you are in a 
you order, have, or waiting, you're ordering a tea or coffee somewhere and you're standing in line and if you look around there's almost nobody and probably nobody who is not looking at this little thing. This is scary. Thirty years ago it was just radio and television and you would, people would sit there for hours. But nowadays you have countless sources of stimulus for the, for the mind that draws you into continuously thinking about what's your next Facebook post, what's it going to be, and you look at the ones that are coming in, all these people are doing these fantastic things, <laughs> and me, I'm just sitting here, and then you have to pretend that you're also doing fantastic things. <laughs> And usually it involves taking a nice selfie. <laughs> and then you project your self-image, which has existed for a long, long time before. In humans, they have, a, they have a, this part of ego is to have this image of who I am. And, but in, in this Facebook, now you have the opportunity to project that image into the world and it'll reach hundreds or thousands of people all at once. And then you, you construct your life. You, there are many people alive these days who, without knowing it, they partly live for their Facebook image. And they're just looking for the next thing that they can project out into the world. It's Narcissus. You might remember the myth of Narcissus, the Greek, ancient Greek myth. There was this young man who had never seen himself before because they didn't have mirrors at the time. But one day he happened to look into a little pool of water and he saw himself and he realized that he was extremely beautiful. He said, oh, that's me. <coughs> and it, the story goes he fell in love with himself. Not in a good way. But <laughs> not by becoming one with who he is, but, but the separation happened. This myth shows the, the beginning stage of the, the egoic sense of self expressed as a story. The image that he saw of himself in a pool is the mental image of the ego set, and stories are part of that image. That's me, I'm me and my story. So you have the image of me and then, oh, so this guy, Narcissus, he experienced that separation. Uh, and then I think something bad happened to him, but I don't remember what. <laughs> <clears throat> so, and then you have other things that continuously stimulate the mind that almost designed for you not, to, not to, to, to become still. It's like the civilization has made a great effort to come up with as many things as possible to prevent people from becoming still and spacious and taking a moment of ah, looking at the sky and feeling the inner spaciousness arise and becoming aware of the, the leaves of the tree or the branches and the wind blowing and it, the noise of water, the simple thing becoming still, alert, sensing that stillness within. And of course, a minute later, another text message is coming in. <laughs> Of course, you have to look at it immediately. <laughs> and then I'm told, I didn't know that when I first started using text, Erin told me that the etiquette is that you have to reply immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and emails are coming in too. Oh dear, I must be very important. I'm getting all these messages. <laughs> <laughs> 